Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming to one of our free educational programs at the not-for-profit art space, Franklin Streetworks. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm very excited to have Nail and Blake here. Um, I'm going to read their bio from my cat the catalog that we wrote. And then we're going to just have a conversation until around 5, and then we'll open it up to questions. So either jot down questions if you have them, or hopefully you have a good memory. Um, all right. I have to jot. I'm a jotter. Um, OK. Uh, so Nayland, um, after earning his MFA from the California Institute of the Arts in 1984, Nayland Blake has exhibited uh, their work internationally in solo and group exhibitions. Interracial desire, same-sex love, and racial and sexual bigotry are recurrent themes in Blake's sculptures, drawings, performances, and videos, and zines, which I read about that people kind of don't talk about anymore. But um, <laughs> and I mean, you know, generally, I don't yeah, see yeah. it as much. Uh, Blake participated in the 1991 Whitney Biennial and the 93 Venice Biennale, uh, the Tang Teaching Museum. Uh, the Tang Teaching Museum and Art Gallery at Skidmore College, Saratoga Springs, New York, presented a survey of uh, Blake's performance-based work in 2003, and his work was the subject of a 2008 survey exhibition at Location One, New York. Um, in 2012, uh, Yerba Buena Arts Center, is that how you pronounce it? Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yerba Buena yeah. Center for uh, the Arts, yeah. Oh, it's Center for the Arts. Um, in San Francisco, presented a one-man a one exhibition titled Free Love Toolbox, exclamation points after all those words, and Blake was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship um, in 2012 as well. Uh, Blake chairs the International Photography Center Bar and MFA program and lives and works in Brooklyn. So, just a few Howdy. accomplishments. Oh. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to scoot this back a little bit cuz okay. I'm cuz I feel a, I feel a little There we go. Now I can see everybody <laughs> instead of having to always like uh, craning check back craning over here. Neck. Hi y'all. <laughs> So with considering Nayland's experiences, I, I could have asked a million questions. So I decided to kind of root it in things that relate a little more directly to this show and another show. We have a couple questions about another show he's in as well right now. Um, so I'm going to read. Normally, I just wing these things, but <laughs> I, <laughs> I was too nervous to wing it with Nayland. So <laughs> um, OK. So the first question, uh, and I'm doing that thing that I hate when I read interviews where the person asking the question says like so much crap at the beginning, you're like, get to the question, but I'm doing that thing I hate. So. And no apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so considering uh, Katie Nolan's uh, writing and interviews, which date from 1989 to 1990 and 1994, those were the writings interviews I used to think about the show. Um, they operated as a touchstone for this exhibition. It was important to me to have the exhibition begin in the 1990s. Um, the, that's when she became well known in the decades she greatly influenced in art and the decades she quit making art, actually. Um, uh, but it was challenging and felt like a risk to include identity politics in the mix, um, conceptually and with identity art from that era, um, without becoming so mired in those histories that, that the works in this show, which date through 2015, might have been seen as a direct trajectory um, since so much work connects to individual and shared identities in the show. Um, you've talked about how, artistic ex um, how artists exploring identity in that era in the 90s became codified into an artistic style. Um, in a Brooklyn Rail interview in 2013 with Jared Ernest, you said, I, I do think that one of the problems coming out of the early 90s is that identity work somehow got tagged as a style. This is the problem of trying to transform a society through a market. So my, quest my questions are, um, how did 1990s work around identity open up possibilities for your practice as a young artist at the time? And what strategies have you used to continue making work with the baggage that comes with identity work being tagged as a style? Um, and then maybe if there's anything about the work and the, the veggie quick work in the show that kind of connects to that, this question, which is made in 97. Okay. Right? Um, uh, well, you know, maybe uh, actually something that might be helpful, and, and I will confess I was given these questions beforehand, so I've had a little bit of time to stew on them. Um, uh, it, you know, something that might actually be helpful is to do, uh, just for me to do a little bit more history, which is um, that, um, you know, I, I uh, was born and grew up in New York, went to Bard College as an undergrad, 
um, went to CalArts for grad school, and then after leaving grad school in 1984, I moved to San Francisco. Um, and uh, and at, in San Francisco, um, my first job was working in a cafe, um, but my <laughs> second job <laughs> um, was working as a program coordinator for a space not unlike this, a space called New Langton Arts um, in San Francisco. And um, one of the things that, uh, that it was an artist-run nonprofit, one of the things that we were trying to do there was to provide um, a kind of bridge back and forth between like developments that we saw going on in the art world in, in various places around the country. So um, I actually curated um, uh, work by Katie um, in that space um, in, I think, it, I think it was probably like 88 or 89, something like that. I began to hear about her work. I was making a lot of work at the time that was using um, uh, bondage and restraint and stainless steel stuff. And so people were like, oh, you should hear about this other person who's, um, yeah. And so, and, and I sort of connected up with Colin DeLand, who was the dealer who ran um, American Fine Arts in New York and was an, a very early supporter of Katie's work. Um, and so there was a, already a sort of connection going on there among those of us who were sort of in our 20, you know, in, in our 20s to early 30s. Um, and, and I think that what happened, the thing that sort of got tagged as identity politics um, was really the, the market responding to um, a lot of other people's work that had been going on for like five years previously. And a lot of that work got its momentum um, out of uh, social activist movements, right? So you had a lot of queer people who were, whose work was becoming politicized out of their response to the AIDS crisis. You had people who were working on um, immigration issues in um, in uh, you know in California um, around migrant farm populations, you had people who were involved in um, in uh, women's movements out of reproductive rights. That, you know all of that stuff was sort of happening in the mid '80s in a very in a very particular way, and um, and so uh, you know I always felt like that work. It's not so much that 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 those impulses were an artistic style. It was a generation of artists using the techniques that they saw coming out of the sort of postmodern generation to articulate a political position um, that was. Um, you know, uh, different than the sort of standard postmodernist one. And so, and, and maybe I can give like a sort of my brief take on that, yeah. which is that, um, you know, going, coming out of the 60s and going into the 70s and early 80s, you saw this thing in the art world where the sort of narratives of um, successive artistic movements and, and, and modernism figured as a sort of succession of artistic innovations kind of broke down. And it started to break down with, after pop and conceptualism. And then you had this sort of pluralism and the sort of early generation of postmodernist artists sort of presented that breakdown, the, the collapse of central meaning the the um, the sort of the the failure of central structures as a kind of tragedy, right? So we had a lot of paintings of ruins, and we had you know we 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 look at the pictures generation and we see this way that like all all photographs are being presented as kind of inherently meaningless and interchangeable. So that's that's sort of the state of affairs, right? That this that the things that we look to to make meaning for us have sort of broken apart. And what are we going to do with that? 
Well, if you're a person who benefited from centralized meaning systems and structures, then to you, that looks like a tragedy. If you're somebody who has been excluded from those structures, if you're a person of color, if you're a woman, if you're a queer person, then that looks like an opportunity, right? It's like all that stuff got broken apart and we can reassemble it into something that actually works for us. So that to me is I think the thing that characterizes the work of that successive generation, the, work, the things that I saw going on in, in Katie's work and in, a, and in the work of um, you know, someone like Felix Gonzalez Torres and, and a bunch of other artists. And there was a sort of excitement about seeing that happen you know, on the East Coast, seeing it happen in Los Angeles, and, and also feeling like we had a part in that in San Francisco. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so <coughs> I think that, that that's a kind of social reality, that people who have been excluded from the system are now finding ways to develop their own voice and their own places of meaning. And, um, and so that's happening in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, when I talk about the problems of that being turned into a style, it's like the only way that the sort of high-end art market can, can deal with ideas really is to turn them into styles. Because it is, for the most part, a market that is built on successive, if not obsolescence, at least a kind of notion of annual transformation so that you keep people coming back and interested in picking up different work. And so you saw an embrace of all of this very politicized work by the market for a few years, and then there was a sort of poo-pooing of that in favor of a return to painting and termed in ter like a sort of intense cynicism that you started to see in coming into the work you know, people like John Curran, like the, these sort of artists where it was all about like, okay, now we're gonna give you value. Now we're going to like actually return to these forms. Like the hand and right. things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and all of that stuff that was making you think about your place in the world politically, oh, you know, it's, it looks so dated. And so, and the word that people use to tell you that they're afraid to think about something is obvious. Like that, like that is the critical word that is deployed. It's like, oh, we already know about that. We already know about that, it's obvious. So why are you telling us that again? Um, so, yeah. I, you know, I think that that's kind of, and I mean, so that kind of rollback was also tied to a kind of rise of neoliberalist economic thinking under the Clinton administration. And so we start to see those things, mark, you know, the sort of stylistic link between those markets and the political thinking at the same time. And okay, so now we're in a moment where that has collapsed again, right? right. Where it's where um, the reason why, I mean, aside from the fact that it's 20 years, and so there's a generation of people who were very young when this work was first being deployed, so it's exciting and, uh, and intriguing to them. Mm -hmm. um, but also, it's, you know, we're once again at a time of, um, of the collapse of centrality. And so, you know, the notion of identity, um, not as you know, a stick to beat people up with, but rather as a, a way of um, producing meaning in one's own life is something that remains central to me. Um, but it is, you know, it's, it's not a thing that is um, readily commodifiable, I think, in terms of the relationship to the market. And we've also seen a kind of collapse in critical structures aside from the market. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing that sort of happened. You know? So how, how 
I feel like I feel like you you that was much, a whole lot. You much like no, it was awesome. <laughs> I feel like you much like Katie Nolan, although she just kind of dropped out Duchamp style, right? But um, uh, when you're saying like kind of how you you're you're not your work isn't identifiable by the market, or is it, it feel like you're kind of like slipping? You you keep you've been doing work around identity even when it was considered obvious, and how how have you? Do you have any ideas about how you've managed to do that, to like keep making work, keep being shown in and out of the fashion of art about identity? I mean, I'm lucky enough to have um, a dealer who uh, does not rely on me to pay his rent. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because if he did, we would both be in trouble. I mean, he, could, he would not be able to, you know, I mean, he can go for years and not sell work of mine. Like that's you know he has other people he has other artists that he represents that that um, that that sustain that operation, mm -hmm. um, but you know in part one of the reasons why I work with him is that um, you know I did not want to be in that position of being the person who is. Um, the one who, you know, the person who's like keeping the whole operation going. Right. Um, I think the, those choices about what I'm going to make work about uh, are really, really divorced from what do I think is going to provide me with income. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I have, you know, I have a job that is you know, a full-time job, working as an administrator, you know, running a graduate program. And that is, um, that's, that's what pays my rent. That's what pays right. for my studio. That's what buys me paper and colored pencils. So. Right. <laughs> so when you, so you're with Matthew Marks Gallery. So mm -hmm. when you. Um, 25 years. Began that relationship. Did you have that discussion or did it just kind of organically where you're like, you kind of just figured it out as you went? Well, I mean, I started working with him um, when he was just starting. So he was kind of, um, you know, I mean, his first gallery space was really not much more square footage than this space and the downstairs space together. And it was up on Madison Avenue. And one of the things that was exciting about it was the fact that it was like off the beaten path. He was somebody who was my generation who um, was, you know, had a real kind of response to the work. Um, and so that's what the discussion was, you know, it was, it was about, um, it, it was not about this being a big operation. It was about like, okay, well, here's like yeah. this interesting, weird thing, right. you know, that wasn't the expected thing. Or like, hey kids, let's put on a show. Yeah, kind of exactly. Feeling. Yeah. 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 Um, and, and I mean, it's really interesting and weird to see where it's gone since then. But I do think that the core of it, I have to say, is that, you know, in, in all the years that I have known him, um, there are some people who deal art because they, you know, they got distracted on the way to opening a car dealership. <laughs> you know, you know, I mean, if they, they would, they are, they're interested in selling, you know, in, in selling something on a certain scale, and that's, that's what's interesting to them. As long as I've known him, he's a fan of artists and art. So that also helps, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, oh, anyway, no, no, go no, ahead. You, there you go. No, I mean, I, I would also say that the, that the other thing that has been really important to me is that the major, um, I show with Matthew, but the sort of the major exhibitions um, in the past couple of decades have been at nonprofit spaces, have been at, um, at art centers or artist run spaces. And, and that, that is, a trajectory and and career path that has always been hugely important to me, you know. Yeah. 
And I, I think that's a thing that we have to continue to argue for. Spaces like this one. Spaces exactly like this one. Um, the spaces that provided me with my first job, my first opportunity to be on a board, my first, you know, um, the, the organization I work at now, the International Center of Photography, is it's a museum and a school, but actually it's an artist-started um, nonprofit space that got it started in 1975. So there was this big generation of, um, of, of people starting their own art institutions um, because they saw that what was there in the commercial art world at the time was not answering their needs was not displaying the sort of work that they thought was important. And um, that has been, um, you know, that's the art world that I have been lucky enough to be able to spend most of my time inside of, and it's the art world that I try to train my students to go on and, and create and sustain going forward. Yeah, I'm, I'm very influenced by that art world, even though I was a little late. I was young, so I wasn't part of it, but um, the idea of alternative art spaces and artists, you know, generated spaces was a huge influence on, like, my thinking when thinking about this yeah. space. And even when I was at a major museum, I put, I made, like, a little alternative space within the museum, you know. So, yeah, yeah it's well, important. And, and that's the thing that brings us back to this idea of identity politics. Because what is that except claiming an identity as an artist but not just as an artist, but as an artist who can also be responsible for creating opportunities for other artists. You know, for a cultural maker who can create structures that sustain not only their own work, but the work of their peers. And, and so to me, like the sort of attack on that notion is, um, a, is really, a, a, uh, an attempt to divert us from the things that are spiritually sustaining in our lives towards a notion of commerce as setting the agenda for what's important for us. That's a great lead into my next question. This is though you knew. See how we do that? <laughs> We're gonna take this on the road. Um, okay, so in, in, in addition to uh, Nolan's writing and thinking, um, this show is also part of a personal inquiry on my part. Um, as a curator and a person, uh, they're inseparable, sadly. Um, uh, it, informed, uh, it informed the artists I chose for the exhibition, especially you and Rodney McMillian, um, Rashid Johnson, and Cheryl Pope. Um, and that inquiry is essentially this sort of grappling with equanimity between sort of humanistic, aspirational, spiritual impulses, um, like the Dalai Lama sort of te teaches that everyone wants to be happy and, and avoid suffering, right? That'd be an example of something we all share. Um, and then also I've been reading um, some Buddhist, you know, for a long time, Buddhist writing around, but lately a lot of it's around mindful connection um, and compassion practices, um, like Sharon Salzberg and Joan Halifax and Tara Brock. Um, uh, but then also there's been a lot of scholarship around intersectionality and how everyone's experience is unique and not to assume everyone's having, you could all be in the same room and having a very different experience because of you know, race, uh, class, color, um, country of origin, um, all that stuff, so, and sexuality. Um, so we focused a lot on intersectional shows here. We've done a lot of social practice shows here with feminist shows and LGBTQ themed exhibitions. We're having a show uh, that uh, sort of looks at aspects of refugee crisis, the next show. Um, but I, for this show, I was trying really hard to think about like this, you know, without falling into the trap of humanism, but also trying, because I feel like, I thought of this show before Trump got elected, but, mm -hmm. but I, I, I really already was seeing that this kind of siloing that, that is important to like, for people to have platforms to speak about what's happening to them, but then on the, on the, on the flip side, you know, thinking about what connects us, right? Because if you don't have a point of compassion for someone, then it, it, there has to be a point of entry to understand alter, alternative mm -hmm. points of views. And those are usually shared points of entry, right? So um, Emma uh, Drew, who did a review of the show that just came out yesterday, said that um, the curation of the show focuses on the difficulty in talking about common experience while living individual identity-based realities and the tension between siloed camps and shared hopes, dreams, and histories. So, and then in an early 1998 interview, or 1998 interview, which is just 
because it kind of all happens. It's almost like you're like an oracle. Um, uh, <laughs> you said in an interview uh, called in a book called Interventions and Provocations, um, you said we are at this very weird point. In 1998. We are at this very weird point in American history where people, when people talk about rights. Um, when they talk about rights, they're talking about negative rights. They're talking about my right not to have to see that, my right not to have somebody spend my money on that, my right not to have my kids encounter these ideas. Somehow we've lost the ability to talk about rights in an expansive, generous, performative sense. A big part of our mood nationally is that people are frustrated. All of this information is coming at them from different places, but they can have very little effect on any of it. Their ability to make changes in their lives is incredibly limited yet they're expected to be concerned about things all over the world. Um, can you talk a little bit about your approach uh, and positioning and perspective and thinking about individual and shared experiences in your work over the years and or today? Um, and one of the things, I feel like the familiar human scale objects that you put in your work is something that, that can be a shared uh, connection. Um, anyway, if you, like that kind of, you know, that mix. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> One thing, like, how sweet does that sound in 1998? <laughs> like, if only I knew what was coming down the pike in 20 years, <laughs> right? Um, I mean, I, and another way of saying that is, like, I, obviously this has all been, like, where we are now has been at least 20 years of Bruin. So um, I think that... Um, I think the thing that's important about art making and art viewing is that um, it, for me, allows me to return to a place of not knowing, of of and a, and a productive relationship with not knowing, so that um, it, uh, you know, a lot of times we're conditioned to, like, if we don't know what's going on, are the, the correct response is supposed to be fear or flight or like a move to definition, right? We have, today we found out that our president is an extremely disciplined and focused genius <laughs> by his own recount, right? <laughs> um, which means that he knows, he knows what's going on at every moment, right? Because the worst sin any of us could ever commit is to admit that we don't know. Um, and usually the way that we encounter works of art is that we have to make up our mind about them uh, immediately. Um, we, have to, we have to get it, and we have to get it right. Um, and, and I think that like art making is a class of thought that allows us to have an important relationship with not getting it, with like sitting there and not knowing. Um, so I think that's the part that kind of connects to the, the sort of the Buddhist part, which is that at the moment that I let go of knowing, then I can actually return to the moment and see what's going on mm -hmm. in the moment um, at, the, at the point where I'm trying to, to decide what everything means. I'm, I'm worried about some future moment where I'm going to be called right or wrong or... Right. Um, and it also points to the way that um, a lot of times intersection, the notion of intersectionality and, and the notion of um, and people's identity um, is used at, in a kind of punitive sense for other people. So that it's like, no, this is the reading that this thing has. There is no other possible reading for it. Mm. You got it wrong. Um, you're not, you, you don't have access or, or uh, you know, a kind of um, validity to that because you don't have my, you, you don't have my experience. Right. Um, and, and, and again, I feel like this is like a kind of fear response. Um, so it allow, it, making things allows me to move past my fear of, uh, of of being in the place of being uh, unknowing or not or or or, or not knowing, um, in terms of sort of like the everyday object mm -hmm. thing, um, maybe a good example is actually the piece that this this piece that you have here, which is which was born. Um, I I would say probably about 
I don't know, maybe a, 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 it's probably close to 20 years. Well, not, not maybe, like 15 years ago. I started just asking myself the question. I was having a really hard time working. Um, and I started just asking myself the question of like, what can I do with what's around me right now? Like what, like, wh what is around me? Like, like what sort of a gesture can I make with what's around me right now? And um, I started to make some pieces that, you know, were a whole variety of things. But, um, but at one point I was, I uh, was out walking my dog um, on my block and, um, and, you know, I live in Brooklyn. I'm like walking around the block with my dog and I'm like, God, you know, what, like, you know, look at all this crap that's on the street. Like, it's really shocking. Like, how much garbage is on the street? And there's a garbage can right on the corner. Like, why can't anybody do anything about that? <laughs> why doesn't somebody do something about this, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and I sort of had the thing of like, oh, wait, I'm somebody. I'm a somebody. Like, why don't I do something about it? So I just like, I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take one thing off of the street like each day as I walk the dog. I'm gonna like take a thing off and I'm gonna try to do something with that thing. And so this chain here, this piece is um, a month long um, chain of like a plastic bottle a day walking the dog, like all of them sort of like you know, I took them home, I washed them, some of them I washed better than others, <laughs> um, and, and sort of made this, you know, made this kind of chain out of them. And that is, like, very specifically just, in that way, they're kind of like record of consciousness. So that it sort of shifted from me going, like, um, why doesn't somebody, why doesn't somebody, like, make my life better why are other people so like horrible and inattentive to me being like, okay, I got to go out and walk the dog. I hope I find a bottle, <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it's like that shift of consciousness is as much about, you know, um, using art making to try to, 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 think our way past these opportunities, you know, these, these sort of impasses that we find ourselves at yeah. as much as anything else. Yeah, Salzberg has this uh, funny quote or funny story in her new book where she says, um, my friend of mine and I were stuck in traffic and we were really irritated and her friend looked at her and said, she said, you know, we're the traffic too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So it's very similar with yeah. the bottles. Yeah. 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 Um. <laughs> yeah. And it, yeah, and you, and you also mentioned in an interview that that some of your work for a while was about being cranky. Would, <laughs> would that would this be part of that? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, I think so. It's like okay, <laughs> let, like let's. I mean, I do think that there is, a, and I talk about this with my students a lot. I think that there's a tendency, um, in making work to kind of construct this odd persona. Uh, that is uh, that is somehow not quite us. It's like the persona that has like a slightly better wardrobe and <laughs> is like slightly like has read a lip a little bit more theory and is you know is just like that much more together. And that's the person who's making the work. That's the thing that the that's that's the work the person that's supposed to be responded to. Um, and I guess to me, uh, thinking about my background, I was like okay, well, why am I trying to pass as this person? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm the person who's living my life. I'm the only per... I, I'm like... I'm, I don't get another one. So why am I pretending to be this other person in... through making my art, which is, like, the most private, but supposedly personal thing that you can do? Why am I supposedly doing this the, for the benefit? You know, why am I putting on this act for these other folks? who, you know, they're not living that life. Mm -hmm. So it's about trying to be true to your experience, whether or not you're cranky at any moment. <laughs> but I do think it's a, often a thing about passing, which is, you know, a thing that I think about a lot. Mm -hmm. So it extends to passing as an artist. Yeah, I mean, I think... Or the temptation to do so. I, I think that... Um, I 
I think that where I would like to see our society get to is to get to the place of thanking people for their difference. Like, we live in a society that has a, a sort of civil rights model, right? Mm -hmm. Which is based on a notion of sameness. It is, ba it is says that mm -hmm. on a certain level, our, the differences between us are not enough for me to be denied um, human rights. That, that at a certain level, we are the same, right? Right, right. right. Um, and, and that is very far from the idea of, um, like, like, I wanna thank trans people for giving me a way to think about the complexities of my own gender identification. It's like white people should be thanking black people for giving them the method to understand the ways in which they are performing whiteness all the time, right? Yeah. That one of the things that I, that I always say, um, like I like I do a lot of teaching in the kink and BDSM communities, and those are communities where it's like. Um, you do a lot of talking about what it is that you're going to do before you do it. Mm -hmm. You do a lot of negotiation. You do a lot of work around consent because the stuff that you're doing is potentially dangerous, right? I'm like, this is the gift of that community that you have to do that talking. People who are, at, you know, in the parlance vanilla, like, they're told all their lives that the sex that they do is natural, so they should automatically know how to do it. They shouldn't have to talk about it. If they do, there's something wrong with them, right? It's like that, you know, kinky people have developed a technology that actually benefits everyone in terms of talking about, like, having intimacy together. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, and so, so I think that that's the, that's what, what my work is, is an attempt to kind of articulate the complexities of my own um, experience and worldview. And it's there as a kind of model for other people to use. They, I don't expect them to have my experience. I hope that some of the way that I articulate it mm -hmm. Uh, allows it to be useful to them. That's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> really, it is. I love that. <laughs> yeah. And I think it benefits, you know, if everyone had that perspective about other people, then you also have that perspective about yourself and there's more self-love and less self-shaming and more like, I'm great the way I am, you know? Like, if, if we kind of adopted yeah. that culturally. Or, or that I have stuff to work on. Right, But right. it's like, but it is something but to work okay. on. It's not an either, it's not an either or. You know, I mean, I think that, um, anyway, go ahead. Okay. There's, go ahead. Okay. I'm gonna check the time, because this is so much fun. We could, I could be here for, all right. All right, it's 4.51, Nalan. <laughs> what is that, two questions? <laughs> 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 The questions, the questions were just you, in case there was dead air. Little did you know <laughs> when you invited me up. No, I love it. I love it. Um, okay, uh, so let me see. Um, okay, oh yeah, let's talk about, uh, I want to talk about, you're in a show right now called Trigger, Gender as a Tool and a Weapon. It's a group show at the New Museum. Mm -hmm. um, I saw the show. I kind of feel like I need to go back, but I, it was It's really, there's a lot of. There's a lot of work There's a lot show. going on. Um so, uh, but I, I think it was interesting. This, uh, let's talk about generation a little bit, mm -hmm. and then um, and then maybe we'll start taking questions. Yeah, okay. sounds good. Okay. Um, so, in writing about uh, trigger gender as a tool and a, and a weapon um, at the New Museum, uh, Peter um, Shadal, I'm guessing is how you pronounce Shalyal. it. Shalyal. Shalyal. Oh gosh, I was totally off. Shalyal. It's okay. Okay. Writes. Uh, writes. He's in, not here. He yeah. Well, know. he's gonna see the video. <laughs> I'm sure. 
because I'm sure he's dying to see what I'm Hi, up Peter. to, Peter. Hi, Peter. <laughs> um, writes, in the art world as safe space, the New Yorker, which is a review of the show, um, he's, he wrote, for rep- weaponized weirdness, consider the accomplished and influential elder, sorry, <laughs> 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 Naylan Blake, who is 57, not an elder. Um, um, there's an air of renegade yesteryear about this antic effrontery. Um, <laughs> and then you wrote in the behavior catalog, which is, uh, we have here, if anybody wants to flip through it after, um, in 2009, um, I'm nearly 50, and the one thing I can say is that the process of, of working is one of constant excavation, of excavation, a binding up and unraveling of different threads of my experience and consciousness. Um, so the, the writer intimates that there's, um, he also intimates in that same review that there's less misbehaving from younger generation of queer artists. Um, and you mentioned in the Brooklyn Rail um, interview that experiencing um, now, ex- now historic exhibitions and experiences is not the same as researching them. Um, so like, so, so like you experience them for real and then people are researching them now and that that's a very different experience. And you talked about it saying there's an abundance of information, but if it doesn't matter, but if it doesn't matter, um, I can find images of white supremacists, of bestiality, of Austrian Gothic Lolitas, which I have not looked up yet. I have no idea what that is, by the way. Um, and all of it requires, requires something, which is just some typing. So I think I, like, I think that's a, a it's, it's the same thing which is some typing right right it's the same thing so I'm talking some, I'm and there I'm talking about like the process about like online ser- right. search and research right so so um, which is just some typing and none of it puts me in any sort of risk or reveals me which I think is one of the revealing things about this quote um, and that is the thing that is different. Um, talk about the Times Square show. It was, a, it was sketchy to get there. The, bro- the block just off the train was a block you could easily get robbed on. That was revealing in a very different way than Googling is revealing. We relate to those experiences very differently. We hold on to them in a very different way. So the struggle we have right now is to regain that. Um, so this show begins with work at the eve of the internet and goes until today. Um, and so the quote kind of seems, you know, it connects to the energy generational aspect of the show and to like just generally. Um, do you feel uh, that his take on your practice is accurate? And do you see his supposition about a generational divide in regards to younger artists being more well behaved to be on point in the show or generally? Um, yeah, so we can start with that. Um, wow. Um, I, <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to say bad things about Peter. I'm just saying, like, no, you know, I'm what, a, I, to be this, honest, this like when that re- when, no, 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 when that review came out, I was like, uh, 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 wow, that's kind of hilarious. Like, I mean, you know, who doesn't want to be? What is it like? Something an influential elder, accomplished, yeah. accomplished and influential For elder. Weaponized weirdness. Consider the accomplished uh, sh- and influential yeah. elder Nadalyn Blake. Yeah, which there's is- an air of renegade yesteryear about his <laughs> antic effrontery. <laughs> I think you need a shirt that says antic affrontery on it. <laughs> I know. That may be my, my new drag name. There you go. Antic affrontery. <laughs> I like it. Um, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I just, um, it's, uh, I mean, the short answer is like, wow, I was surprised that he had noticed. I mean, you never know, like, it. I, he's somebody that I've crossed paths with for Many many years, and you never know what a, what a critic is thinking about you until they um, until write they something. write something. Um, and I think that's sort of the first thing he's ever written. So, uh, um, uh, wait, should we tell people what he was talking? He was talking about your bison, right? He was cut. talking about the performance and in, in the in the new museum. Um, I think that I, I guess my take on it right now is that in the context of the gallery slash museum art world, I think what he's trying to point to is that um, he is remembering a time when people were willing to be much weirder right out of the gate in that context, in the context of galleries and, and, and museums. Mm-hmm. And I think that there is a tendency for people 
to professionalize and particularly for people it, like I see this all the time as I'm as I'm talking to young artists they try very hard to get kind of grab onto an issue um, develop a kind of symbolic language around that issue and then replay that symbolic language over and over again and that because that's the thing that makes them kind of legible as a politically engaged person in the context um, it doesn't and so I think he's sort of trying to talk about that mm -hmm. in the review mm -hmm. that that there are many works in that show that are quite um, recognizable in their form. I guess what I would say is that, and this has a lot to do with the performance, one of the things that's been super exciting to me has been to be in places like the furry fandom and, and in the BDSM world, places where people are engaging their creativity in a way that really doesn't surface in galleries that doesn't, like there is an entire art world on places like DeviantArt, on an, an online um, forums that never has anything to do with the gallery system and is all about communication and people getting what they want. Mm -hmm. Like, and literally like artists making a living off of making drawings of digital drawings of people's um, various um, furry characters, um, and and doing so by through a commission process, right? And so these people, like this, is an entire art world where the sort of wildness that that that. Sheldon might be thinking about is actually going on, but it's not at all visible in that show, and certainly not visible um, in in the larger context of that art world. Yeah. That to me is, I'm always really interested in places where people get what they want by asking for it, hmm. like <laughs> directly. <laughs> and, um, and so I, that's, so I think that, um, in some ways, in the if we talk about like the, you know the, the the MFA museum gallery industrial complex, there is certainly a, a level at which that is highly professionalized and very different than the art world that Peter saw early on, and and mm -hmm. and that certainly that I was talking about like with the Times Square show. On the other hand. There's, um, I wouldn't look to the new museum to actually be able to provide a forum for that because it's not a tool that's really kind of built for it mm -hmm. or that it really works at. Mm -hmm. So in that, in the show, I'm performing, um, I, again, I'm kind of doing a kind of crossing thing. I'm doing a thing of like moving back and forth between those two worlds. I'm I am wearing a fursuit that is a um, that is uh, uh, what is called a fursona of mine. It is this character that I sort of come up with that is in some ways an expression of myself, and in other ways a kind of um, wish fulfillment of myself. Um, in that outfit. Uh, I'm riding the elevators at the new museum. Um, I'll be doing it again next Saturday, a week from today, for the last time for the show. Um, and I have these buttons. Uh, I have a tray of buttons with ribbons on them and, uh, and a sort of instruction sign. And the, ins and the idea is that you pick up the button, you tell the button a secret, and you pin the button onto me as the character. So at this point, after having done it for a few, I, I think probably about six times now, at this point there's about 600 of these buttons and ribbons um, on the suit. So on one hand, yes, I'm performing as this character. On the other hand, this is like sort of part of a trajectory of performance work um, that is, 
you know, comes out of things like Yoko Ono's cut piece and 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 other performances like that, um, performances that I've done where people feed me, things like that. Um, so those, so that in that performance, uh, which is called Crossing Object, it I'm trying to talk about the fact that um, the character is serving as a kind of interface of, of sort of public presence and intimacy for both myself and for the people who tell the secrets to the, to the buttons, mm -hmm. right? Um, Kaya, our intern, had some questions about mm -hmm. that. So I, want, I don't want to skip her question. Yeah, yeah. Raise your hands. Hi, Kaya. Kaya. <laughs> Um, Excellent question, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's about it's about the same performance. Yeah, yeah. So not lo lo not long ago, you started your performance series, Crossing Art, uh, Crossing Object, and like no in Gon Nomen. Nomen. Um, Short for nomenclature. Oh, nice. Um, <laughs> why choose a bear bison that can change sex and gender as your official fursona? Um, and. Uh, on the website at the New Museum, it says, with the title, Blake refers to W.D. Winnicott's notion of the transitional object, a stuffed toy or blanket that children use to construct a sense of selfhood independent of their parents. Uh, Noman serves as an objectification of Blake's hybrid identity. And um, her question is, do you feel um, as if Noman is the only way you can express your hybrid identity in terms of your gender and racial background, or does hybrid indicate a combination of other additional aspects of your identity? Um, I think it's one of the ways that I that I can express it. So it's um, it it was uh, like as I, I and I and I have to say that I mean I had heard about the furry fandom for a long time um, had, and had only really gotten um, really involved in like the past five years or so. Um, so as I was sort of, you know, thinking about that and I've certainly done pieces where I've been like in animal costumes and drawn, you know, do, done a lot of drawing and I mean, and, and going way, way back in the, you know, in the late um, 80s, there was sort of the emergence of like the gay bear thing, right? So a lot of gay men identifying as bears. Um, uh, and, um, and I sort of watched that identification sort of form, like, and, and turn into this sort of odd cliche, but I, but I watched it in its formative stages. Uh, and so when I was thinking about like, okay, I want to get more involved with furry, like what, what, you know, what makes sense to me, like, as a sort of animal identity, and um, and it was, it it sort of struck me that I really wanted it to be like a hybrid, um, and so I think generally the way that things have gone in my work is that there will be an impulse like that. And then I'll be like, okay, why? Why did I have that impulse? What is that about? Um, and initially, um, Noman's gender wa uh, was relatively stable. And then as I sort of thought about it more and, and was sort of commissioning drawings from folks and, and doing stuff, I was like, well, you know, this is a cartoon. This is this is you know, and in some ways, all of this grows out of people like watching, and and people like myself watching like Bugs Bunny cartoons, uh, you know, and 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 watching cartoons on Saturday morning. And it's like one of the things that was always super exciting to me about those cartoons is transformation, um, and and you know, and moving from one thing to another, and um, and. As I uh, and as I um, began, you know, being emotionally involved with more trans people and being, you know, being um, in dialogue and in social spaces with people who identified as gender fluid or gender queer, um, I began to think like, okay, what, you know, 
what about this? You know, what is my relationship to gender? What is my relationship to, to, um, you know, to this? And so, it that's it became one of the venues for exploring that, you know. Um, and one of the things that I'm really grateful to in terms of the new museum situation was the opportunity to just sort of like express that, you know, um, publicly. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way that um, a thing that was really important to me in my, in my career um, early on was um, the curator Thelma Golden including me in the black male show at the, at the uh, Whitney in 94, um, because I think that not many people, um, you know, knew that I was black. And like being included in that show was like a sort of like, you know, another sort of like coming out. Um, and so that, so, you know, I, I sort of, when I was asked to be in the show, I sort of like took that opportunity to be like, okay, um, they want to make this thing about gender, like let's do something with Noman. Like let's do something, like this is a place where I'm exploring that in my work that hasn't been visible in a gallery sense yet, you know, um, so let's, let's do it there. That's great, good question. <laughs> um, okay, so. We started a little later, so let's give it like 15 minutes, 20 minutes for questions. Does anybody? Well, that was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Yeah. yeah. The thing with Chief is that mostly the art department borders on politics as well. Mm hmm So the question is, is asking if Nayland has any politicians who feel like he are going to forward the vision that he has. Oh, um, that was quick. <laughs> yeah, you've you've stumped the panel. Um, I don't. You know, honestly, I don't. Um. I, I, in, in the national sense, no. Um, I will say that, um, you know, uh, there has been a certain amount of like progressive organizing in my city council district. Um, and, uh, and I guess the stuff that I feel like kind of closest to is um, issues like, um, you know, development um, and, uh, and, and housing and healthcare. And so there, you know, I, I feel like the people that I voted for for city council in the last election in New York were people who's, since I could get behind, you know. Um, I don't, uh, yeah, I mean, to me, I think that's kind of what it comes down to. Like, like, you sort of vote in the national elections and cross your fingers, um, uh, but I believe that at the, local level, like, that's the place where we're actually engaging with our neighbors. That's the people where we're, it's, it's like, the people who are right around us. And like, how are we gonna actually make life better for them, you know? Um, I do feel like, I mean, one of the reasons why I tend to say no in terms of my agenda is that I think we've gotten this, like, this, this stupid, stupid notion in the U.S. right now, which is that, um, you know, there's there's too much money in politics, and that all these like lobbyists are going to corrupt all of our politicians. I know what we should do. Let's just in, let's just elect super rich people. They could never be corrupted, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, it's like this idea of like, oh, well, let's just put the oligarchs in charge, 
and then they won't be like swayed by the people who are trying to sway them. You know, it, it's so I unless there's like, um, you know, we should have a shorter election cycle. Like it should not be two years of campaigning. It should be, um, you know, we should do away with the electoral college. We should, um, you know, uh, um, elections should be publicly funded. You should be able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, and uh, and and campaign advertising should be publicly funded. And and I don't see anybody <laughs> advancing those arguments at this point on a, on a national level. But that's but that's the sort of stuff that I feel like needs to needs to happen you know any other questions yes Mm -hmm. And just curious, like, sense of place. Mm -hmm. Does that, and, and this work out here, I mean, very local, mm -hmm. just in terms of an immediacy about where you are and responding where you are. I, I'm, just, I'm just curious, like, that, does that have a certain role, that, like, where you're experiencing things or the environment in which you're... So the question is for the video. As, um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, what? A, a sense of place and how that affects your work and sort of the, the two coasts you've lived on and, and the bottle piece being part of your yeah. daily life. I mean, I have a big, big rant about this. So <laughs> thank you for asking gonna, that question. I'm going to get a glass of wine. Um, I, you know, um, the, <laughs> the, we, one of the crises facing art making at the moment is the myth that an art object should be a thing that could potentially go anywhere and potentially be seen by anyone. Yes. If you look at the history of making art objects throughout human history, overwhelmingly that history is a place of extreme locality. If you painted an altarpiece, right, in, in, uh, you know, in a church, the people who saw that were the people in that church who saw it every week, and they saw it accompanied by music, and they saw it accompanied by text. Most African masks were, are made to be seen one day, uh, you know, a, a year potentially, or fewer. You know, it's, they are not made to be universally viewed by anyone at any moment. And so this notion that um, what art is supposed to do is to function in this kind of like blank way and go everywhere is really a fantasy of transnational capitalism, right? It's like, why does capitalism love the dollar? Because the dollar can go anywhere and mean the same thing. That's the opposite of an artwork, right? Artworks are conceived in relationship to specific circumstances. That doesn't mean that they can only be used by viewers in those circumstances, but I think that we are living in a time where we are not valuing the specifics of those circumstances when we present them and, and look at them. And the thing that fuels this rant for me is that you know, I spent 14 years in San Francisco um, and uh, was very involved with the art scene there. And I was back this summer and went to uh, the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And this is a museum that, like I got through the entire show there, like all the shows that were there <coughs> and got done and I was like, okay, with the exception of one show that was like a local art award, if that show hadn't been there, I would never have known that this museum was even in California, much less that it was in San Francisco. And so the idea that you would tell the story of modern art 
without like talking about people like even you know people like John Baldessari, who's a Southern California artist. But but aside from that, like amazing works by Northern California artists who I know that they have in the collection. I know that those things are there, but their fear is that they will not be taken seriously as a world-class museum unless they display a certain like series of works by a certain series of artists who are supposed to somehow confer quality and status on that, right? That, it, to me, is an abandonment of the things that make museum going pleasurable. It's like, when I go to a museum in Wichita, I don't want to see the same stuff that I could see in New York. I want to find out, like, what's the, what is art like in Wichita? Like, that's what's exciting to me. And that idea that we have now of this sort of, like, international style um, that is sort of fueled by art fairs and these, and these big sort of biennial expositions, I think only really serves collectors. It just serves to confirm for them that they didn't get it wrong, that their taste is universal, that anywhere they go in the world, they see their taste reflected back to them. And that's not my job. That's like not my job to confirm for you that you spent your money in the, in the right way. If you can't figure that out for yourself, then tough luck on you. <laughs> like, get it together, you know? Um, and so I'm really in favor of us like making the case for the people that are around us, making the case for like whatever the community is, um, whatever the neighborhood is, like making that case as being important. Uh, because uh, again, it's like those are the people that we deal with every day. So. Mm -hmm. I I wouldn't presume to teach people in Cambodia like what is in what's important about their viewing experience. My hope is that it's like, you know, when I am looking at something that comes from another place, I'm going to make a certain use out of it. Some of that is going to have a relationship to the intention of the person who made it. But a certain amount of it is not going to have that, and I would, and I'm, I'm excited by whatever uses they might make out of this thing, that they, um, you know, that that this thing of mine that they see. Those are the those are the readings that are for me the most exciting. When it's somebody that I don't know who like saw something years ago, and they're like, oh, I saw this piece of yours, and it made me think of like this, this, and this. I love that. Um, but that's, I don't think of that as educational, right? It's not like I have something that I have to instruct them in. It's like the way that, that works of art and works of literature and works of music like sit in our minds. Like think about a song that you heard on the radio as, a, as like a kid and you had like a whole sort of fantasy relationship to it, you know? Um, and then you hear it years later, it's like it's a piece of your mental furniture that you've used to have tons of different kinds of emotions with. To me, that's so exciting to have made something that someone else can put to their own use, much more so than, um, than there being a message that somebody has to get. Um, and in the way, I think that goes back to the thing about humanism, like this idea that we're supposed to touch the universal human in each other and recognize that. To me, that's, it's like, uh, again, that feels like a kind of generalization and sameness. Like, like I'm, I'm excited by somebody making like a weird use of that, you know, uh, of the stuff that I made. Like, at one point I was asked, Somebody asked me the question of like, if you could be any other artist, who would you want to be? And the answer that I gave is, I would want to be the person who designed the sock monkey, <laughs> right? 
It's like, we don't know who that person is. <laughs> like, we don't know who that person is who, like, came up with the idea of, like, I've got this pair of socks. I'm going to make this monkey out of them. <laughs> but think about how many people have used that sculptural invention. Think about how many people who've had, like, emotional relationships with sock monkeys. Think about how many people have, like, you know, made use of that over time and across space and in all of these different ways. What an amazing thing to have done, you know? And and <laughs> it's like I could never be that good, you know, <laughs> to come up with that. Unless unless like the bottle chain becomes like <laughs> the big thing and you guys were here at ground zero or something. But but I mean that's you know what an exciting way to kind of like be in the culture is to not just come up with a thing that's just about reifying your own individual experience, but is a vehicle for many, many people to have many different kinds of experiences. All right, I think that's a good, I think that's great to end on. Do you have anything you just are dying to say that we haven't touched on? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have such a hard time with that normally. No, 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 okay. this is great. Thank, yeah, thank you, you guys everyone for so coming. much. It's a great for, crowd. It's, it's, so, it's as cold as Mars outside. I'm like, I'm amazed that y'all braved the cold. Thank you for yeah, coming. Thank you.